Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our March 22nd, 2021 meeting of the Rotary Club of Raleigh. Uh, welcome to members and guests. Uh, we are having a science day today uh, at the Rotary Club. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Jonathan Frederick. I saw Jonathan um, already is, has joined us today about the North Carolina Science Festival, uh, one of the largest public celebrations of science in the world, from what I understand. Uh, so uh, um, we have that to look forward to. We also have, uh, as always, lots of announcements about the various opportunities. We really want all of you all to get excited about the upcoming day of service and all of the activities associated with that. So please be uh, listening out for that um, and some other interesting announcements we have. Um, we want to make sure that um, now that we have uh, you know, done all the work to get prepared and get all these opportunities available uh, that we take advantage of them. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started now with the invitation and pledge from our Director of Administration, Richard Watkins. Thank you all so very much for your time and attention. And if you would just bear with me today, um, I just like to freestyle. I know usually I come with prepared invocations and invocations from people, but I was just thinking about something different and something was heavy on my mind today. And it was from the words of a motivational speaker known as uh, Jim Rowan. And I think if I could start anywhere, I think it would be here. Um, in which he described in part of what we're dealing with in general, right? And there's no easy way around it is you know, the, the great war between good and evil. Now, I know we don't like to talk about this kind of stuff very often, but you know, there, there is a war going on. Um, from the moment you were born, you were involved in the war between light and dark, between negative and positive, between ease and enterprise, between democracy and tyranny there's a war going on, right? You know, if, if in the absence of light, what comes in? Darkness. In the absence of democracy, what moves in? Tyranny. In the absence of good, evil moves in. See, the good news is, however, that evil's no match for good. It's not, not even close. However, however, good must be active. Good must be active. You know, the weeds will always come in and take over your garden if you do not tend to it. But if you get active, hey Mike. you can move back the weeds good. as much as you choose. Uh, Richard, somehow you're muted. Oh, oh, I see what happened. Uh, they muted us all because there was some background noise. I apologize for that. Um, but, you know, that doesn't stop what I was trying to say. I'll jump right back into it and just say that we always have to be active and we always have to commit ourselves to service because if we ever ease up on our commitment to service, then there are people who are going to go without. If we ever ease up on our commitment to service, there are people who are going to go hungry. If we ever ease up on our commitment to service, then there are people who will remain sick. And if we ever ease up on our commitment to service, we will no longer be Rotarians. And so all that I wish on this day, and all I will leave you with, with this invocation is I pray you remain active, committed to service. We've got to be making sure that we're winning the war between good and evil, light and dark, 
helping others. Empathy over apathy, love over hate, commitment to service, stay active. That's what I pray. Thank you. Now, if you would all now join me for the allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Monday wasn't off to a good start. I am sure that Sutherland's beautiful singing certainly brightened your day. And with that, back to you, President Eric. Thank you so much, uh, Richard and Sutherland, uh, for uh, inspiring words and uh, the beautiful singing. Um, you know, if, uh, if you weren't kind of fired up to, to find one of those sign-up geniuses uh, for April 17 to uh, get engaged in some service, um, hopefully uh, Richard uh, did a good job there of uh, making you realize uh, it's, it's time to get engaged and become active through Rotary and the best opportunity for us going forward is uh, through our April 17 day of service, uh, which we will be hearing more about from Gina in a little bit. All right, uh, we have some um, guests here today and uh, would like to um, give Harrison uh, the opportunity to um, introduce um, our special guests. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Eric and Richard. Seriously, one of the best invocations I've heard in a long time, man. I, I, don't, I don't know what else to say, this is fantastic. Um, one of the two, so we have the, the distinct honor of introducing, I believe I saw two of them on the call here today. We have uh, Tejas and, and Quentin, uh, they are both uh, part of the, the North Carolina State University's chapter of Engineers Without Borders. Uh, so myself, uh, Mark Hackett, uh, and Gina, we had the distinct honor of being able to connect with them uh, through some uh, connections that Mark Hackett had. Um, and, and they do phenomenal work. Uh, if nobody, if, if you haven't heard of their, their organization, please check them out. Um, I will actually put the link in the chat so you can check them out. But they line up. It's, it's crazy to see how well they line up with Rotary's um, kind of some of the, the service projects that we do, uh, the things that we try to do in our community. This is their mission statement that's on their website. It, uh, it says the, uh, the Engineers Without Borders North Carolina State Chapter strives to develop sustainable energy practices in local and international communities through research, education, and networking by building on existing infrastructure with committed members, consistent funding, and technical expertise. Uh, they currently have active projects in Guatemala and Sierra Leone uh, revolving around water system projects and renewal energy projects. So want to say welcome to both uh, Tejas and Quentin. And guys, if you have anything else you would like to add, please feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and introduce, introduce yourself. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Harrison. And the invocation was fantastic, of course. Um, I guess I would like to add really quick, aside from our mission statement um, uh, and our three main uh, projects, which Harrison kind of already mentioned in Sierra Leone, we're working on providing a school with a source of safe drinking water and creating a solar array for the school's power. We also have a Guatemala team that's constructing sustainable rainwater catchment systems for every household in this Guatemala community. And finally, we have our local North Carolina team that's been working on not only implementing an irrigation system at Powell Elementary, but also volunteering at other service events. So aside from these project teams, we also hold consistent fundraising efforts, one being our annual benefit dinner. So this year, we're actually holding a large virtual event with a panel of speakers 
who talk about EWB and sustainable engineering. And it's an effective way that we kind of bring our community a little bit closer together. So the stream is actually gonna be on April 17th, the same day as your uh, service day, but it's gonna be in the evening from five to 8 p.m. And all proceeds of this event will go to our supporting our chapter and project teams. And the evening will consist of presentations from our international and local teams, as well as a discussion panel of keynote speakers. And we're also gonna have a short, short segments that dive into a little more about the culture of the communities that we partner with. And we're even gonna have an auction featuring items from local businesses and our international partner communities. So that being said, if any of you would like to attend and have some time maybe on the evening of the 17th, we would truly, truly appreciate you all coming out. Um, I think I can send Harrison and Mark information about how to attend in like a follow-up email that they might be able to distribute. And even if you can't make it to the dinner, you can always still support us by checking out our website at ewbncsu.org. Um, yeah, that's all for me. Thank you so much, everyone, for having us on the call today. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys for being a part of uh, today's uh, Rotary meeting. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, welcome. Uh, hopefully that's a group of uh, future Rotarians, among other things. Um, uh, and we're so glad uh, that you came uh, to join us today and um, excited about uh, your, your April 17 event as well. Um, next year, we'll, we'll get with you in advance to coordinate some of the timing. Uh, we've got our uh, wine tasting fundraiser that evening kind of right, right on top of yours. Uh, uh, so uh, hopefully people can, um, can um, multitask a little bit and uh, um, support both events. Thank you so much. Um, all right, um, any other guests uh, that, would, um, that we have today? I don't see any, but if there are, please unmute yourself and let us know. I'm not seeing anyone else. Everyone, please remember to uh, make your donation to the CART virtual bucket, either by sending a chat or email to Linda. And at this point, I believe we have some happy dollars and we'll go right back to Harrison. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I, I actually reached out uh, to um, Linda this morning. Um, I was, I don't know if this is what you're talking about. I'm so sorry. Yeah, but yes, I, I'm, I'm going to be uh, doing happy dollars. Uh, I would love to donate $500 to the, uh, our Rotary Foundation. Um, so that, that, that was my that happy is, dollars. That, that is awesome. a... Um, Thank you. <laughs> that is an awful lot of happy dollars. Yeah. Uh, 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 raising the bar wow. uh, for the rest of us, uh, uh, the new price for a happy dollar is 500. Uh, those those uh, are very happy dollars. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, Eric Larson uh, is probably the happiest uh, of all um, for that. So, um, Harrison, uh, that, that is such a wonderful. Um, wonderful gift, and um, we will uh, we will accept it uh, with happiness, and and uh, be sure that it gets put to good use as we always do. So thank you so much. All right, um, Linda, I understand you have a happy dollar. Yes. Um, well, after Harrison, mine is going to seem cheap, and I apologize, <laughs> but uh, I have uh, ten dollars in happy dollars because I got my first Pfizer vaccine over the weekend. I had to go to Oxford to get it, but the added bonus of that was I was able to um, sample the treats with my husband at the Strong Arm Bakery there, which I would highly recommend. It's a beautiful drive in the country, and. Uh, it's right downtown, so I'm very happy about that. That's uh, definitely cause for happiness indeed. Uh, yeah, I've recently gotten shot number one too, and it's, it's uh, for those of you who haven't at least had the first one, uh, uh, I mean, there's such a feeling of just relief, uh, just knowing uh, that you're kind of getting some protection. Um, any other happy dollars for anyone? All right, um, coming up, we have um, some more great programs, um, including uh, next week uh, is going to be Tar Heel uh, Week uh, with the Rotary Club with Coach Matt Doherty um, of uh, UNC fame. 
and um, he's uh, written a book called Rebounding from Failure, and uh, we'll be hearing uh, from him, and uh, all you Duke fans can just send, you know, send all kinds of hate notes in the chat. Um, so uh, look forward to that, and then uh, the following week, uh, we will take uh, um, Easter Monday off, uh, and so, uh, and then, uh, you know, we will be sharing, uh, you know, information uh, next week about some upcoming uh, programs. Got a lot of things in the works. Um, so be on the lookout. Um, next, uh, let's see, I was thinking that this might be a good time for us to hear from Martin Worf, uh, who has uh, managed to go through the process of uh, volunteering to provide uh, uh, some services associated with uh, COVID vaccination sites, and uh, we thought it'd be helpful to have him share with us. Martin? Thank you, Eric. Um, <clears throat> for everyone's uh, information, I believe uh, Linda and the district uh, sent around information on the North Carolina Capital Medical Reserve Corps. Um, a few months ago, and I decided eh, that might be a good opportunity to volunteer, and uh, took took them up on that, and was uh, trained as a non medical volunteer for that organization. And uh, absent the pandemic, I think the organization normally serves local uh, sporting events, uh, soccer things like that for uh, sideline care or or aid in um, uh, delivering some general medical care uh, at, they might be at like first night Raleigh or something like that uh, to help people who are having, um, having some difficulties. But uh, for in the pandemic, they are tasked with uh, helping volunteers uh, get with uh, local health departments on administering COVID vaccinations. And um, after several hours of training and almost uh, not passing my Bloodborne pathogens test. Um, uh, I uh, was cleared to go volunteer and have volunteered twice in uh, um, Lee County in Sanford for two vaccine uh, distributions. And um, it's been very nice. Uh, they're all day events, drive through at that particular location. And so the non medical volunteers. Uh, do basically everything other than administer the shots. And a large part of the training was um, to get uh, certified to be able to inf enter information into the database. And for those of you that have gotten one shot, um, and that's a database run by the state um, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. And you can um, help enter that information in as people pass through and that keeps everybody going along um, easier. But it's been a rewarding experience for me and one I hope to do again. And if there are other people that are volunteering, um, I'd love to uh, hear about it so we can make sure that everybody gets recognized for what they're doing. Great, uh, thanks a lot. And I do uh, see that uh, from the chat that Duncan Jennings also uh, has volunteered for that. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, Duncan. Excellent, uh, yes. All right, um, next I did want to make a, a, an announcement. Uh, uh, we have heard that uh, Frank McNally, longtime member, uh, Rotarian of the Year, twice of our club, um, had a stroke recently uh, on Wednesday. Um, and uh, so far as we know, he's uh, recovering well. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that he and Debbie would appreciate uh, your thoughts if you wanted to send a note. Um, and, as, and once we learn more, uh, we'll, be, we'll be happy to share that. Uh, we'll send out an email and share uh, any information we have. But uh, again, uh, Frank McNally uh, did have a stroke, uh, but is uh, in recovery and doing fine so far as we know. Um, and Linda, I don't know if you've heard anything else since then. Uh, no, I have not. Reagan was the one who reached out to me and said he's Facebook friends with um, Debbie, and that's how he first heard about. Apparently, uh, it happened last week while Frank was at work at the pit. So uh, if I hear anything else, I will definitely share it with people. Yeah. So I know everyone is uh, very concerned, and we will keep you updated, but uh, just wanted to, wanted to share that information. 
Um, and uh, Deborah, I wonder if you could put his mailing address up in the chat at some point. I mean, Linda, Linda. <laughs> Um, or I can look and see if I can pull it up. Well, what I was going to do was email it to everyone today. All right. That'll be perfect. Thank you so much. Um, the next uh, announcement is I want to let you know uh, we have um, the Peace Center Conference uh, still coming up on April the 10th, 2021. Uh, two different sessions, 9 to 11.30 and 1.30 to 3. Um, you'll hear from uh, the center's graduating um, Peace Fellows, 18 of them. They'll discuss their research and answer questions. Uh, so uh, it's a great opportunity to hear about uh, this, amazing, um, this amazing Peace Fellow uh, project that we have going on in our own backyard here. So um, please, if you are available on the 10th, uh, please join in. Um, next, uh, Gina, do you want to discuss uh, the fundraiser now? Sure. All right. I can do that. Well, hello, everybody. Happy Monday. Um, Alex can't join us uh, this Monday to promote the fundraiser. So hopefully I can do it on her behalf. Um, as you guys are aware, for our day of service, we are trying to raise at least $7,000 and part of our efforts will be uh, doing this through a virtual fundraiser. As you may recall from last fall, Alex put on a great wine tasting pairing and we are going to try to recreate that. So the City Club of Raleigh, our longtime partner, has agreed to um, again partner with us and we are doing a wine pairing with Girl Scout cookies. So join us on um, April 17th. It'll start at 6 p.m. Uh, the cost is $80 um, and, and no, a lot of that does go uh, to the charities. We have seven um, charities that we have uh, picked out. So all of your, all of the proceeds will go to those seven charities. And in addition to that, we'll have the sommelier Patrick go through the different wines and explain why Girl Scout cookies have no calories. So that's what I think he's promised. Um, we will also have raffles um, and fun uh, and, and other types of fundraisers going on and prizes. So really join us. It's a great event. Um, really need your, um, you know, for your participation for the day of service in some capacity and they want to thank um, those that have already either donated and or have signed up for this event. I think we're almost at 30. We only have 100 seats and I'm going to be promoting this to the district on Thursday. So right now it's a first come first serve for our club but come Thursday it's going to be marketed to the entire district. So please 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 sign up um, where you can find signups. Linda has sent out um, an email pertaining to the wine tasting. And in addition to that, you can go to our main website and in on our main page, um, in the middle section, you will see the link where you can sign up. Uh, you can click on that link, which will take you to the sign up page. And then Linda will bill you accordingly. Um, I think that that's it for me in terms of virtual wine tasting. Hope to see you guys there. Thank you so much, uh, Gina, and stay tuned for more from Gina about the day of service. Uh, but right now we actually, do want to- Actually, Eric, I'm gonna have to, I have to actually drop it one. So okay. would you mind if I went really quickly through my, my day of service stuff? Um, sure, absolutely. And uh, Charles, I hope we'll get to you quickly thereafter because I know you have to leave too. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, well, we'll, well really quickly uh, on the uh, also on the main page, guys. Um, there is um, uh, you know a couple of service events. We have over 200 signups um, available on April 17th. Um, some of the events that you can do are. Um, uh, cleaning up Raleigh parks. So if you and maybe a church group or um, a social group that you want to join um, can get together and maybe, you know, pick a, pick a park. That's a part of the list uh, to either, you know, 
do a park litter cleanup and or maybe you want to help the boys and girls club wash buses and clean those buses to make sure that they're really sanitized for COVID-19. Um, so because keeping children safe is, is really important. Or maybe you want to help wake smiles, um, rebeautify some of their areas and help them with a painting project. There's also Habitat for Humanity, helping um, them in their restore buildings. In addition to actually getting out information pertaining to COVID-19 um, and helping um, communities learn about some resources pertaining to that, there is a lot of signing up. We have, like I said, there's over 200, I think there might be 250 spots where I'm looking for people just a couple of hours. I'm not looking for the whole day. A lot of the events are only, you know, two or three hours of your time. And I'm really hoping the morning of Saturday, April 17th, you can come out. Um, so more details to follow. And I'm sorry that I was rushed on that. Of course, I just, I have to jump on another call. So um, I'll provide more information next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. And uh, guys, uh, there are a lot of uh, just open spaces on a lot of uh, great sign up geniuses right now, and that won't always be the case. So if you want your choice of how to provide your service on April 17, uh, go ahead and go to the website, find uh, your volunteer opportunity of choice and sign up. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, all right, Charles, uh, tell us about uh, your weekend. Uh, so. Tom and I spent nine plus hours on Zoom calls Thursday, Friday, Saturday. This is the commitment that we made on behalf of the club. Uh, so be kind. Um, but it was, uh, unfortunately, this was the first and hopefully the last time that a PETS president elect and training um, seminar um, will be conducted virtually because you lose a lot. Surprise, surprise. So I met a lot of interesting people online, but that's the limit of it. Um, it is, uh, it was very detailed. I mean, I've been in Rotary since 1989. I learned a lot uh, in the nine plus hours of, uh, of being trained. We got to hear from the present incoming Rotary International President, um, Shaker Mehta, um, and he talked about his um, program his theme of service. Let me get this correct. I don't want to make an error. Serve to change lives. Uh, there's going to be a big push on expanding membership. Uh, our club is actually not in that bad shape compared to some others in this district. One has lost 40% of their members, the other 50% of their members um, pre COVID, during COVID. So we're, we're doing fairly well, but they really want us to add more. Um, anyway, there'll be a lot more information that will be coming out from me and from Tom and from the board as we put together a plan for next year. So and that's real quick, but I also, unfortunately, also have to jump for a, a client call. So thank Thanks, you so sir. much. Thank you so much, Charles and Tom, uh, for volunteering uh, your time uh, to serve our Rotary Club and to attend lengthy Zoom meetings. <laughs> okay, um, next we have uh, Christy Santacana with a membership report. Everyone, quick uh, reminder that we have our virtual social this week on Thursday. It'll be at 5.30 p.m. Uh, till 6.30 or 7, however long you all want to stay on, but uh, we will send out a Zoom link this week for that. So if you can attend, we'd love to have you. Thanks so much. All right, please, uh, please join in on Thursday for uh, fun and fellowship. Thank you so much, Christy. And I think that uh, that covers most of the announcements. The one last thing that I wanted to mention um, is uh, to thank uh, all of you all for uh, responding to the survey about um, uh, returning to in-person lunches. Uh, we have uh, gathered and we are incorporating that information and uh, our uh, engaging in discussions with the city club uh, about uh, health protocols and uh, logistics for hybrid meetings that would allow people to, um, to still uh, participate via Zoom or in person, depending upon um, uh, how things work out for, uh, for different people. And so um, 
just be on the lookout for more announcements as we kind of work through and figure that out. But uh, uh, certainly there's a strong sentiment uh, for us to, to find a safe way to get back together in person and uh, enjoy lunch in person the way Rotaries, uh, the way Rotarians do. So uh, we, we're gonna keep working on that. All right, got uh, lots of birthdays um, this week. Happy birthday to Sean Doyle. Uh, Matt Barfield on the 21st um, yesterday. Uh, Elsa uh, coming up on the, uh, the 35th of, of March. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, that's kind of, I guess that's kind of like a leap year or something like that. Um, and I assume that's the 25th. Uh, happy, happy birthday, Elsa. I hope you enjoy your day. Um, Alex and Mark Livingston are on the 26th. And so happy birthday to Alex and Mark. Um, and uh, the anniversary we have is our zoom anniversary. Uh, approximately this time last year was the first time that we uh, started meeting uh, virtually via Zoom. Uh, so we've been doing this for a year now, and because of that, uh, um, uh, you know, I know it's, that there's been both good and bad uh, to the way we've had to do things, and we are working. Uh, to get ourselves back to back to normal um, as soon as we can. So uh, looking forward to uh, being a regular old meet in person and have lunch Rotary Club uh, in the near future. With that, I'm gonna turn the program back over to Richard uh, to introduce our guest. Hey, thank you, President Eric. This is, uh, this is an awesome, awesome um, opportunity. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I think since I became uh, director of administration for the club, I knew that I was going to invite Jonathan. I know most people, when they think of March Madness, they think of basketball. But when I hear March Madness, I think of the eve before the most amazing month on the calendar year, and then that's April, uh, because we get to enjoy North Carolina Science Festival. And as a, a science enthusiast, as a scientist, as a nerd, proud nerd. I was just super excited uh, to have Jonathan on. And I, I've known Jonathan for a while. Um, he's always a tough act to follow. Um, as the president of Sigma Xi, the UNC chapter, we do science cafes on one Wednesday every single month. And he does an absolutely amazing job hosting that. And then I have to jump on and do all of the stuff like, hey, thank our treasurer. Thank you all for your donations give us more donations. And so I'm kind of like this lull after like Jonathan just crushes it uh, with his emceeing uh, talents. And so he is absolutely awesome. And I have uh, had the, the joy and luxury of presenting alongside him several times over the course of probably the last five, uh, six years. So it's been really, really incredible. But let me just tell you a little bit about Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan is a science communication and non-formal education expert working at the intersection of higher education and cultural institutions like museum and authentic, inclusive community collaborations. From scuba diving and shark tanks to breaking a Guinness World Record to selling out the D-Pack in Durham, Jonathan has produced a wide array of spectacles to connect audiences to the impactful program. He currently directs the North Carolina Science Festival one of the largest public celebrations of science in the world and is the senior manager of programs and strategic partnerships at UNC Chapel Hill's Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. And I would add, because it's not in here, it's the first ever statewide celebration of science and they have been in all 100 counties of North Carolina. So without further ado, please, a warm round of applause and a welcome to Jonathan Frederick. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you, Richard. Wow, um, and what an incredible um, invocation! I'm stirring. I'm, I'm stirred. I'm fired up. Thank you for doing that. I am uh, still thinking about that. I love that concept of empathy over apathy, which is such a such an important thought. And thank you to all the Rotarians on the call for all the service projects you do. It's, it's humbling to hear and inspiring. Um, I'm Jonathan Frederick. I am in uh, the game corner of my basement in North Durham. That's where my wife hates that I present from down here, but I, it's authentically me. So I'm going to do. I'm going to keep doing it until we reemerge from from this pandemic. 
Um, before we dive into some of the prepared remarks, I'm curious, just for a little word association, I always think it's fun to do this, particularly after this year we've just had, where science is on the forefront of our minds. What, uh, in the chat, type in, uh, when I say the word science, what's the first thing you think of? You, there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. Just drop in whatever, the word science. What do you think of when you hear that word? Oh, these are good. Bill Nye, fair, logic, insects, I like that one, rigor, cure, searching for answers, method. I'm gonna need to download this chat. These are great. Um, Beaker from the Muppets, awesome. Yeah, really good. Analysis, space, yeah, these are great. These are all, these, these are all right on point. How about if I say festival? What are some words you think of when I say the word festival? Speaker getting some love in the in the chat. I like that. <laughs> Insects again. <laughs> Bluegrass festival is amazing. Yeah, incredible. International Bluegrass Festival. Balloons. Fun. State fair. Excellent. Jazz. Yep. And then lastly, let's do, uh, if I say North Carolina, what are the first things you think of when you think of North Carolina? Excellent. I love these answers that I'm seeing. So what I direct as Richard alluded to is the North Carolina Science Festival. And you notice that when I said those three terms, science, festival, and basketball, or sorry, I was reading that, I'm thinking about basketball, and, uh, and, and festival in North Carolina, you're seeing these things that are all sort of different, but also quasi related in that um, we all have these different associations with these terms, but they overlap. You know, we're talking about culture here. And what we produce is a festival that tries to tap into the culture of North Carolina and associate science, create the same fond associations with science that we have with other topics like food, like sports, like art, like music, these really deeply rich, rich things that are part of our everyday lives. And in the past year, man, I can't tell you how much we wish we've done more to build up trust and faith and fond associations with science. Um, Cause I've heard you talking about the vaccines my partner is getting her second vaccine today. I'm lined up later in the week. Um, and we hope everyone trusts the information that's getting out there so that people do feel comfortable in the research that's happening. And our festival is one way to just try to get people inspired and fired up so that they want to learn more. We do all this from UNC Chapel Hill's Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. If you haven't been, let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to give some secret behind the scenes tours now because we just finished a close to $10 million renovation where we got our building all up to speed in terms of code and accessibility, but we also expanded our exhibit floor space to celebrate science and all of its connections. Our mission, and I really want to just point out the bottom part here, is we really want to celebrate science, technology, and health. And we're really diving deeper into the health part of this as we forge ahead. Um, that's all out of this small planetarium and science center on UNC Chapel Hill's campus. Um, and we try to serve the entire state. And one of the ways we do that is through the Science Fest. Now, I may, may have been wrong, but uh, I detected from Eric's opening remarks that um, he was like, yeah, this is the largest science festival in, in the world, huh? And he was sort of like he hadn't heard of it, which is not at all surprising because we are, we are the, one of the largest public celebrations of science in the world, but it's still a celebration of science. We're trying to get out there and serve the 10 plus million people of the state of North Carolina. So we're growing every year. To give you a sense of some of the things we've done, this is a map that was sort of uh, accumulated from 2010 when we launched to 2015. And each one of those tiny dots on that map represents an event partner, not an event that happened in those first five years. Partners may have hosted one event, they may have hosted 10 events. The bluish dots are partners who are at public, event inst uh, public institutions like museums, colleges and universities, libraries. Uh, the reddish or the greenish dots are the uh, K-12 school partners that we have. 
And so we do big things at uh, performing arts centers, like with uh, science celebrities, like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Alton Brown. Um, we also partner with uh, entities like Google, where they do a soapbox derby style race in Western North Carolina for the kids who want to build and engineer cars. Um, we have colleges and universities open their doors and show off labs and do hands-on ex uh, expos. Um, and then we do smaller things, more intimate, more sort of customized and personal events at public libraries, at boys and girls clubs. Um, we really want to have authentic experiences of all shapes and sizes for the people of North Carolina. Um, one of the other things we like to do, just to give you a sense, is because we are science people, is we, we track data, right? So this is a placemat we made to just visualize some of the stuff we do from 2010 to 2018. Um, the maps in the middle show you the smaller one is what was happening when we first launched in our first year in 2010. And then you can see some of the growth and event partners through 2018. That bar on the left shows you how we stack up to other science festivals like us. Science festivals in the country have about 86, you know, close to 90 partners. We have over 400. We have um, a really good scientist to attendee ratio, which is really what we're about. Most science festivals are trying to connect experts to the public. Um, we are incredible at doing that because of all the amazing STEM professionals in our state, in our region, particularly in the triangle. And then that third stat I like because it, you could read it two different ways. We're either uh, really thrifty and frugal or we're cheap, but we happen to uh, stretch our dollars pretty, pretty far. And we have a lot of room to grow. We wanna get our ratings up. We wanna do more to be inclusive and equitable with partners across the state and audiences. Um, but by and large, the take home here is that giant festivals, like you mentioned, the bluegrass festivals, big festivals do things like connect people and like catalyze innovation and new partnerships. And that's what our festival has done since its inception. Um, going into last year, so I'm just giving you some context. We're heading into our 10th anniversary. We rebranded. We made everything look fresh and neat. We had a record number of scientists slated. Get involved. We had a, a record number, I'll never forget, March 13th, 2020, everything shut down. And we were two weeks out, we had to cancel everything. It all went off the rails. And fortunate, and I do want to acknowledge that, we were incredibly fortunate. Throwing a science festival is not the same thing as being a frontline healthcare worker, right? So we were able to talk to our partners and say, hey, Getting all these people together is a bad idea. We're going to press pause on everything, encourage you to do the same. And we quickly pivoted and launched in less than two weeks the virtual science fest. Because you may recall, parents were all of a sudden at home with children who were going to school. So we thought, what better thing to do than still occupy the same space and create a way for all these families who are now at home and, and stressed out to have some engaging online research. We launched the virtual science festival and our partners produced virtual activities. And by April 1, we hosted our very first event. Um, it was actually with a misinformation expert from RTI in the park. And uh, we also got Zoom bombed on that event, which I had never heard of until that event. So we, it was a little bit of trial by fire. So it was really, really, uh, it, was, it was enlightening. Let's say it that way. Um, but we created all these family-friendly activities and our partners got in the act. So this is a lesson of sort of, providing a positive story and positive energy and, and, and not hunkering down, continue to catalyze new things. We had partners from all over the state start to share different activities that families could use. We started to share online resources and live programming. This is the Greensboro Science Center's Facebook page. They started offering science content over lunch times for people to engage. Uh, Carolina Raptor Center down near Charlotte and Huntersville started producing videos that they were putting online and they were getting visitors from all over the country and all over the world thousands more than they normally were getting for their programs. And uh, they also found that the shelf life for virtual experiences was longer. So if there's an advantage to doing things virtually is you can record them like you're recording this meeting and share it with people who can't be there when it's offered. So the asynchronous component is really, really important. And our partners got innovative and creative. They started bundling curriculum. So maybe not everyone wants to do everything linearly. So the Cape Fear Museum in Wilmington is a great example. They just did stuff on bugs, but there's all little snippets, a little sampler menu that families could dip into and find topics that resonated with them or their children. And they had a wide variety of activities. Out West in the mountains, our friends of the Arboretum have launched the citizen science program that has sort of an online gamified badge incentive 
concept where you go on and do citizen science, but you earn badges when you do more, which is super cool. And then some of the tried and true partners found incredible ways to participate. These are our friends at UNC TV who used our network to still host interviews about the pandemic and about the emerging virus um, to create some online and television content as part of the science festival. So we had all this stuff going on all as we were all learning about this pandemic. And I think it put us ahead of where we are, where we would be had we not done that. So this is a lesson of sort of having a presence in the public versus being perfect. And so we had this virtual science festival that we created and we learned all these things pretty quickly. Some of these lessons are no brainers, but they're worth emphasizing. One is play to your strengths. We have a bunch of curriculum and a bunch of partners. So let's get it out there for the public to take advantage of. Audiences found it, which was great. Collaborating can be messy, but is incredibly potent and powerful. Um, some of the other things that were really important for us to learn is that virtual event production is completely different. It's not analogous to working with live audiences or working with large crowds in person. And then finally, and this is a critical point, as you're thinking about service projects and the ways you give back to your communities, access is completely different when you're thinking about broadband. Um, there's an equity issue with who has good internet connections, who can get to virtual programs. And we do want to think about those kinds of things as we're serving our community. How do we get out to areas? How do we touch and, and interact with audiences and families and students who may be a little bit adrift and lost during all this virtual learning? On the other side of that, as we've already talked about, there is um, a really good opportunity to engage people who you might not be able to get to your in-person event. So the geographic barrier and commute barrier, barrier has, has kind of broken down a little bit. And by the way, we won a, a we broke a Guinness Book of World Record. We created a bilingual astronomy kit. We won a Main Street Award from the Department of Commerce. Those are all nice things that all happened during the pandemic that informed what's happening this year. This is what I wanna leave with you, is that our science festival happens every April. It is a month long. It is for the people of North Carolina and all our myriad forums, for people preschool to retirees and everyone in between. We want this uh, just a cornucopia of events this year's theme is homegrown science. We want to celebrate all the tinkering and inventing and reinventing we're doing at home. I don't know how much baking you've done since you've been home, but I know a lot of people are experimenting with some kitchen chemistry. Gardens and yards are looking great. Um, mine needs a little bit more work, but these are all these things we're doing at home to, to, to tap into our inner experts. Additionally, we want to celebrate the incredible science and innovation and engineering that's happening here just like that Engineers Without Borders program. Like I just listened to that young man talking and I was like, we need to get that program celebrated as part of the science festival going forward. Um, so our theme is homegrown science. Um, and we're trying to project just a lot of positivity. People want good stories, they want good news. And we wanna make sure that we're highlighting all the amazing work going on around the state. So one of the ways we do that is branded swag and marketing materials that we send to our partners to share. And you'll see some digital advertising coming down the pike where we're driving people to our website. We also produce uh, elementary school curriculum and kits that we share with uh, as many schools as we can afford. This year, it'll be close to 200 elementary schools with big boxes full of uh, supplies for up to 200 people to do hands-on science and STEM activities. Those go all across the state. We get those in many, as many counties as we can. And this year, to be as nimble and as agile as we can be, um, we're letting the teachers do whatever they want with them to give them, get them in the hands of their students. Some are hosting virtual events. Some are um, sending supplies home to kids. Um, but that's one way that we help reduce barriers to participate. Another uh, program we've pivoted to virtual this year is our middle school science in initiative called SciMatch. Got some additional funding from the Biogen Foundation. And so we're going to pair up 100 scientists with 100 middle school classrooms to do two visits virtually across the state. And that's the biggest group we've ever had, which should be pretty incredible. Um, Futures is another program where we're connecting with community colleges to broaden what people think are careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. This is a storytelling program where staff and students and faculty from non-traditional STEM paths can, can talk about their journey and share their passion for what they do. One specific event I did want to invite you all to is UNC Science Week. We are at UNC Chapel Hill. We do want to brag about the stuff that UNC does. We have, we're lucky to live where there are so many great universities doing such incredible work. Science Week this week is our spin on our expo. Everything in my career that I've been taught for 20 plus years is bad now. Hands-on, big crowds, immersive education, 
we don't want to do any of that. So this is our pivot to a, a virtual experience where the opening uh, Sunday of Science Week, we're showing Jurassic Park at a drive-in movie. And we're going to have some paleontologists pop up on the screen and talk about what they love and what they may wish had been changed or more accurate in the movie. Um, that'll be at a drive-in in Chapel Hill. Um, we're also going to have a virtual science expo featuring shark researchers, public health experts, physics and astronomy demonstrators. That'll all be on the Friday, April 16th. Holden Thorpe is a name you may recognize. He is former chancellor of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and he's now the editor in chief of all of Science Magazine's publications. Uh, he wrote a book on innovation uh, a while back. He's going to be giving a public talk um, to anyone who wants to, to attend about what he's seeing from his vantage point now as the head of uh, one of the leading science publications in the, in the world. And then we're also doing some things at, at Moorhead, where I mentioned before we reopened. Our partners are doing um, just some really fun stuff. If you like trivia, SAS, the global leader in data analytics, is working with us to produce events with the zoo, the aquariums, the School of Science and Math. Um, there's going to be an online virtual trivia series that you can win some, some fun prizes and, and bragging rights as you win the Science State Trivia Championship. Those events will be happening across the state. And it's all at ncscifest.org. I'll drop that website in the chat. But the public calendar goes live every Valentine's Day because we love science. And uh, this year we have 200, 200 plus events. In a typical year, just to give you a sense, we normally have close to 500 events that'll happen, but you know, with, with everything happening and the landscape shifting so much, we're really, really pleased at this hybrid festival where there's in-person stuff and virtual stuff. And then the longer question that maybe some things you're thinking about at your own institutions, I mean, what happens now? So we'll have this festival in April. And some of the things we're seeing, the sort of shaking up the, the, the whole sector is that virtual experiences are gonna improve and change and morph. People think there are best practices now for Zoom. Well, in a year, I guarantee you the best practices now will not be the best practices in a year once we've digested everything and come out of this. The education sector with what's happening virtually and online and in person is gonna be shaken up. That you've probably already had conversations about the workplace where people are working from home and what are office spaces and collaborative workspaces going to look like. Um, in the long run, 2020 is gonna be seen as a triumph of science, without a doubt. It's absolutely incredible what has happened in the past year and how we're able to get a vaccine so quickly. On the flip side of that, there is also a failure of public messaging and trust. And that hurts me to my core as a science communicator at a museum where I feel like we could have done so, so much more. We could have leveraged the festival in so many different ways. I used to always sort of downplay the need to educate people about how science works because it wasn't as fun to me to talk about the process of science. Now I wish I could have told my 2010 self to shut up and we could go back and really start educating people about the way these the way scientists go about their business so that people can understand why things happen the way they do. Um, so those are just some, some of the take homes for you to think about. And then I do want to acknowledge our incredible funders and partners who help us through this science festival. They're an incredible group. Um, these past few years have been difficult in terms of philanthropy. Our budget's never the same. So we were always incredibly grateful for the folks who come on board to support us. And with that, I'll close. I'm put my contact information up there. And I really, really appreciate the time. And thank you, Richard, for inviting me and, and everyone for, for being on the call. And just let me know if you have any questions. I'll, I'll check the chat and I'll turn the, uh, the screen back over. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. That was, that was awesome. That was amazing. And, and also, you know, very timely, especially since we're approaching, you know, the, the amazing month that, that is North Carolina Science Festival. And, and please forgive me, I was distracted. Everybody in my neighborhood was in front of my house staring at a red-tailed hawk that was just perched right on a, a tree right outside my window. And so I was distracted. But did you tell us what events um, are, are in Raleigh um, this year? Um, I did not. But if you go to our website, you can search to find events near you. But again, remember this year, you have an opportunity to get everywhere. Some of the big ones this year that I can think of off the top of my head, uh, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences always hosts the Triangle SciTech Expo in partnership with us. And they're doing an incredible variation on that event uh, in, into the festival. And then the Museum of Life and Science does some great stuff in Durham as well. So I can Google it quickly and I can pop it in the chat if that's helpful. Cool, thank you very much. 
And just uh, out of curiosity, I know you touched on um, the donations in, in the chat a little bit, but are, are the universities involved with, with funding um, Science Festival at all? This comes from Eric Stevens. It's a great question. Typically the funds come through uh, corporate philanthropy. Um, and then we do receive a little bit of m money from the UNC office, um, largely to produce that expo. Uh, but this year, because we weren't able to do it in the way we normally do it, we didn't even request the funds. Um, so it's largely through those sponsors that I've, that I've put up on the screen. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And just out of curiosity, you know, since you've been doing this, you know, just, this is just personal, uh, your personal opinion, you know, what has been kind of like the coolest event that you've had an opportunity to participate in um, in your years of, of managing the North Carolina Science Festival? That is a great question. It's a tough question. Um, you know, selling out a performing arts center, center for a science event and causing a traffic jam as ticket holders were coming in and the police being very confused that it was a science event and that that many people wanted to see science. Um, that was a lot of fun. One event that comes to mind quickly is uh, we did a near space balloon launch from the governor's mansion with a local school to kick off the festival one year, but the winds were going so fast that it blew out and our, our experts were like, that's gonna go in the ocean. And it ended up landing, when it came back down after going up to space and taking pictures, it landed in the Alligator River. And it just so happened one of our partner's husband is in Marine Patrol and he happened to be in the Alligator River and he scooped it out and he was happy to come back to Chapel Hill that night. So within eight hours, we had a balloon go to space land in a river near the ocean and come back to our porch all because of the network of the festival. So that, that was one of my favorites. Wow, that, that, is, that is really cool. Well, Eric Larson asked, he makes a statement at first, understanding science is the basic literacy of the 21st century. What are the risks slash rewards of being a scientifically literate people? That's, I almost could ask you that question, Dr. Watkins. That's an incredible question. I think, um, the rewards are immeasurable because we're, you know, people are right now growing up and they're, we're preparing them for jobs that we don't know, they don't exist yet, right? So being scientifically literate and curious as a young person growing up is going to pay off dividends down the road. Um, the risks, and I'm gonna go a little bit off road here. I think the risks are actually what we're seeing sort of with like the political climate. I think there could be some alienation and frustration um, with people who don't get it. I also think there could be a little bit of lack of understanding of why you need anecdotes and passion to share information. Data doesn't just work. And when you fall in love with data and you only present arguments that are about data, like I was on a call with these incredible doctors for my child's school about reopening and the doctors were doing a great job, but they were presenting like 91% of people say this. We did a survey and the end was 232 people did this. And that's an incredible number. And I was like, this is all right, but it's also too mathematic. We need anecdotes. There's a reason why preachers and politicians are good at what they do. They don't give you data. They tell you stories. And I think that's uh, getting too heavy into the data can be one of the risks of being overly scientific literate. Awesome. Richard, what would you say to me? Well, I mean, I, I would completely agree with you on that, but I think one of the largest problems that we find right now is because education is not equitable, right? Uh, so the pipeline that goes into science produces, by and large, scientists who don't always come from the communities uh, that are stakeholders. And there is a breakdown, I feel, of, of communication. You know, someone who is of, you know, backgrounds that are very familiar and very close with church and so on and so forth knows that the way to communicate is through storytelling. However, if you don't come from those communications where storytelling is key, you'll miss that. And I think one of the biggest shortcomings of science, if I would critique science specifically, is there is a undervaluing of communication. I mean, you run into that all the time as you try to coach scientists up when they speak to Science Cafe is that scientists are very poor communicators by and large. And I think that is why we end up in the situation that we're in is because scientists really focus on being in the lab, but they take very little time or they don't even care of uh, working with the community. And I think that has hurt the community in large, by and large. Great point. I think, yeah, scientists are their whole lives trained to sound smart 
and then we're trying to get them to okay you can sound smart but you need to be understandable as well yeah it's a great point and just to, just so everyone knows because um we define science very broadly at our festival we're looking for people from across fields so like someone who works in finance to us could be a stem professional someone who works in medicine Something, you know, you have lumpers and splitters, some people who separate everything into little categories. Our festival is about being inclusive. And Richard, I do want to just echo your point about equi equity in education. It's incredibly important. Right, right, right. Um, so I, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I mean, this is awesome. If you have an opportunity to participate in any of the Science Festival events this year, please do so. Um, and with that, please join me for a, a, another round of applause for Jonathan Frederick. It was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much. And if I could invite you back to another one of our presentations next week is a great one to wrap up March. Uh, you know, if you're a Matt Doherty fan, please check it, check us out. I'd love to have you back here and introduce you as a guest. Um, but yeah, uh, with that, back to you, President Eric. Thank you, uh, Richard, for bringing in uh, uh, Mr. Frederick and uh, uh, Jonathan, thank you so much. Uh, you did correctly out me as a, um, uh, an English major who uh, wasn't as familiar uh, with this festival uh, as uh, perhaps some of the rest of you were, uh, but uh, uh, you know I've learned a, a great deal and I'm looking forward to participating in some of these uh, homegrown science activities uh, that, that you have uh, on the ledger for, for next month and I hope uh, many of our other members uh, will join me. Um, and I, I really appreciated hearing you talk about, as an English major, about uh, you know, how important it is for, for good scientists to, um, to speak clearly about technical issues in ways that, that lay people understand and, and uh, you know, help us all uh, to, um, to kind of follow uh, all of the amazing work uh, that you guys and, and all of the scientists uh, in, in our great state are, are doing. Um, and uh, you know, we do appreciate um, uh, all your work, uh, kind of uh, getting the word out there. Um, so thank you so much. And with that, we will close another uh, great meeting of the Rotary Club with the four-way test. So of the things we think, say, and do, first, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all the concern? Third, and finally, will, will it be, be beneficial to all concerns? Thank you so much, everybody. Look forward to seeing you next week. We are adjourned. R O T A R Y. That spells rotary. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye, everyone. Have a great week, everyone. You too.